Test shot. Test shot. Test shot. Alive, what is up? I hope that you guys are doing well. Look, I'm here in the youth room. We are unable to gather in person this week, but I thought that you might be missing it, and I'm missing you guys. I'm hoping and praying soon we'll be able to be in this room gathered with tons of students. We'll be able to worship. We'll be able to be in small groups. I'm looking forward to that day really soon, so be praying for that. Be praying um, that we'll be able to gather again soon. I'm really hoping for that in a big way. So uh, we're going to have a great service today. We're going to be back in uh, our book, This Changes Everything. We'll be looking at chapter five in just a moment. But there are a couple of other things that I want to talk about. First of all, we had a challenge last week. And that challenge was to guess how many Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, specifically Michelangelo figures, I have in my office. And there were a lot of guesses this week, which I love but you guys were way off. I think the highest guess and the correct guess is gonna actually go to Leah, uh, who had the highest number. The actual number of Ninja Turtle figures I have in my office is 43. I have 43 figures in my office and that is really, really great. I wanna challenge you uh, with a new challenge this week and it's really simple. All I'm gonna ask you to do is subscribe to our YouTube page. Right now you're watching on YouTube. If you're not subscribed, just subscribe right now, Alive Orlando. And at the end of this week, I'm going to go back and we're gonna do a drawing out of all the live students that are subscribed to our Alive Orlando page. So it's that easy. Make sure that you subscribe right now and you will be entered into a drawing. That is the challenge for this week. Now here are a couple other announcements that I want you to be aware of. First of all, we are continuing to do our Instagram lives Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. We are going through the book of Exodus together and we'll be there tomorrow at 10 a.m. That is Thursday at 10 a.m. So make sure you hop on and if you miss it live, make sure you go back and watch it on our IGTV at Alive Orlando. Now, if you were with us on last Thursday and Tuesday, we were actually not out of the book of Exodus looking at the book of Proverbs because I've also challenged you guys to be reading through the book of Proverbs through the month of July. July has 31 days, Proverbs has 31 chapters, and that is an easy way to read through the book of Proverbs and build a consistent rhythm in being in God's word every morning. So if you haven't started that challenge, there's still time to jump in. Today, you would be in Proverbs chapter eight, and you can just continue to read through the book of Proverbs, take a little bit of time to catch up on the ones that you may have missed. Another thing that I want you guys to be aware of is right after this YouTube video, we are gonna be jumping into a Zoom virtual game night. We're not able to meet in person right now, so we wanted to do something special. So make sure at the end of the service, there'll be some information on the YouTube video as well as a remind text. Make sure you sign up. That is gonna be going out. If you're not signed up to get our remind text, you can do that right now. It's so easy. Just do this prompt and you'll be signed up to get all kinds of information throughout the week about what's going on at Alive. Maybe you have a new number and you haven't re-signed up to get the text, Make sure to do that now so you're staying in the know with everything happening at Alive. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys right after this in our virtual game night, and I hope that this chapter, chapter five, and this changes everything, helps you out and continues to point you to the goodness of Jesus as we grow in our walk each and every day. Love you guys so much. Check it out.
Live. I hope that you guys are doing well as we continue to go through our book entitled This Changes Everything. Once again, if you don't have one of these, I want you to get one. I have a few left. You can order one on Amazon or I will order more for you. But this is a really important book, especially for the teenage years, which was you guys. As you look through this and really just figure out what it is um, about the gospel that's transforming in your life. And so we're going to be in chapter 5 today. And uh, before we get started, I'm going to take a minute and pray. So let's do that. Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the truth that you have come for us. She came down out of heaven, came to earth in the form of a, a servant, and uh, after years on earth, you died on our behalf, Jesus. And so we recognize that today. We don't want to miss that today. I pray that you'd be with this time as we look into this next chapter. Guide us, help us, help us understand um, all the, the, the realities of our faith and what that means for us day by day, the transforming power of your gospel. We love you so much and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, hey, once again, we are going through This Changes Everything. And uh, just a quick recap on some of our previous chapters. We had chapter one talking about our identity in Christ. This is how the, a, a Christian should live. Um, chapter two, our story, uh, the way that the story of the gospel, of the whole narrative from the beginning before even creation, the plan of redemption through Jesus, and the way that becomes our story when we place our faith in Christ. And then week three, we talked about our community. What does it mean uh, that we have a community of believers that is the local church, Little C Church, and the Big C Church, that there are believers all over the world. We are part of a huge community and will one day live eternally with that community of believers in heaven. That's amazing. And then chapter four, uh, we talked about our sin. This was last week. We talked about justification, that we're justified by faith, but we're also uh, living and growing to be more like Jesus each and every day. We are becoming who we already are in Christ. And we also talked about five ways we can fight sin. And I hope that that was encouraging to you. I think we all struggle from me leaders, students, we all struggle with sin in our life still. And it is the power of Christ in us, his spirit working uh, to grow us and just taking that step to become more like Jesus each and every day is so important. And chapter five really leads um, right along with that conversation. So chapter five is all about our disciplines. Um, as Christians, we have spiritual disciplines, um, practices that we do to help us in our growth um, to become more and more like Jesus. This is part of the transformation that's taking place, that changing of desires going on in our heart. And that's so important for us and so important for you. And so we want to make sure that these disciplines are not only things that we know we should do, but things that we're doing and creating rhythms in our lives, things that we're doing well and doing consistently. This is where we will grow in our walk with Jesus the most. And so when we think about discipline, we're like, I don't, I don't want to be disciplined. But it's actually a good thing. Uh, discipline and having disciplines in our life is how we grow in our walk with Jesus. So I don't want you to miss it. It's so important. Well, this is really the picture of what it looks like to have spiritual disciplines in the Christian life because we have already been saved by grace. We are not saved based on um, us being able to do all these good works or you being able to consistently have a spiritual discipline. If your salvation was based on that, we would not be able to get salvation. We cannot get salvation. We cannot um, reach heaven or have a relationship with God because we did a bunch of spiritual disciplines. This is a response to what's already taken place, that justification that has already taken place. We are now, uh, because we've been accepted, now we are pursuing these things out of position of acceptance and love, the fact that God cares for us deeply. And so we get to, we have the opportunity to, we delight in doing these things. That is the attitude that should come out of a heart that has been changed by the reality of the gospel. So this is so important. And I want to read this out of Ephesians chapter 2, you're probably very familiar with it, and I love what it says, starting in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, 
And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And so that is so important. We're saved by grace through faith and not by works. So we have nothing to brag about or boast about. But here's the kicker. Here's what it says right after this verse 10. Sometimes we don't read verse 10. It's really important. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God proposed prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So works aren't just thrown out the window. Works are something that we were created to do. We are created to do good works, but that comes first by being saved through, uh, by grace through faith. And that is key for us to understand the position and the place of works or spiritual disciplines in the life of a believer. I love what first Timothy says, uh, chapter four, seven through eight, it's in the book. It says this, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, I love this, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That's an incredible promise. If we train ourselves in godliness, it's better than training ourselves in our physical body. Training our spirit holds promise for the present and the life to come, our future with Christ. And I love this. We are called to discipline yourself in godliness. And I love what uh, Jaquel says. She says, they are habits of devotion, habits of experiential Christianity that have been practiced by God's people since biblical times. These are spiritual practices that we see. And she kind of connects the dots for us because chapter four, we are talking, we're talking about sin, things that we should not do as Christians. But chapter five is about spiritual disciplines. These are the things we should be doing, the things we are told to do, the things that we should pursue as, uh, as we walk through this Christian life. Not something we do again out of duty, we get to grow in these disciplines. It's an opportunity to grow closer to Christ and to understand God and to understand God's heart for us, his love for us. And once again, we work from acceptance, not for acceptance. We're working from the fact that we've been accepted, brought in by a father. We were that lost sheep out of the 99 that he went after. We're not working for his love and acceptance. We've already been accepted. We may not feel accepted at times and we're like, well, I don't know if I should pursue these disciplines when I don't feel like it. But oftentimes it's the exact time that we need to keep pressing. And then we need to step into these disciplines as the enemy tries to distract us and pull our heart away from the things of God. We need to be persistent, continuing to grow in our walk each and every day. And I wanna challenge you to learn now. There are some people that might say, that it's not really important. I can develop those spiritual disciplines later when I'm an adult and I have a job and a family and then I'll have spiritual disciplines. But I wanna encourage you, that that's a lie, just straight up. That That's not something I want you to pursue right now. There is a beauty and benefit to learning these things as you are young. As a teenager, this is prime time to step into these and create rhythms that will last you the rest of your life. There, there are things that I didn't get to participate in and rhythms I didn't get to build when I was younger that I struggle with now. Um, so I wanna encourage you to do that. Don't wait, don't believe that we're supposed to wait till you're an adult and have it all together because here's the thing, you're not gonna ever have it all together. So there's no reason to wait, don't make excuses. Dive in and start creating these spiritual disciplines today in your life. So let's talk about them. Um, Jaquel gives us a couple different spiritual disciplines to look at. So that here's the first one. Number one is reading God's word. You probably saw this coming. This is really important. And we talked about this. This was one of the ways that we also fight sin is to feed on God's word. And so this is part of both things. And this is the core value when it comes to when it comes to our Christian faith. Why is that? Well, she says it simply. Do you want to hear God speak to you? Yes, I think we would all say yes. And she says, open the Bible. And it's that simple. If we want to hear God speak to us, one of the main ways God speaks to us, and one of the most important ways is through his word. It is active and living, and he speaks to us through his heart. I love what Psalms 119, 129 through 131 says. It says, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. 
We've been reading through the book of Proverbs this month in July. I hope that you have. And there's such wisdom. God speaks to us out of his great wisdom through his word and directs our steps. This is one of the ways that we grow. And having a discipline for reading God's word is so important. And there's amazing things like the YouVersion Bible app. There are ways that we can set up really practically, set up different Bible reading plans. Having a consistent time where you get into God's word is so, so important. I wanna encourage you to do that. And if you've done it in the past, that's awesome. Um, but make sure that you're in one right now. And there's a really good quote on page 85 that I wanna read to you um, that we saw in this week. And it says this uh, from David Mathis. For the Christian Meditation means having the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It is not like secular meditation, doing nothing and being tuned into your own mind at the same time. But it is feeding our minds the words of God, and digesting them slowly, savoring the texture, enjoying the juices, cherishing the flavor of such rich fare. And so really, it should be appetizing to us that we're not just zoning out in meditation, but we're understanding and hearing the words of God, speaking to our heart, transforming our lives. That is why reading is so important. And another verse out of Psalms 119, starting in verse 14, says this, In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. That's so good. So here's the second thing. Number one is reading the Bible. But number two, take it a step further. And number two is memorizing God's word. This is so important. We don't talk about this as much, but this is really key to remembering the truths of who God is, is storing them in our hearts by memorizing. This is another verse out of Psalm 119, starting in verse 10. If you haven't figured this out yet, Psalms 119 is a great chapter. It's long, but it's great. And this is what it says. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. And I love this part. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We talked about last week, how do we combat sin? Well, if you want to combat areas of sin in your life, start by storing God's word in your heart. And the way you do that is by memorizing scripture. And man, Jaquel talks about some serious scripture reading, uh, some books where she eventually ended up memorizing the entire book of Romans with her father. That's impressive. I do not have the book of Romans memorized, and I don't know if I will anytime soon, but that is an incredible challenge. So maybe it's memorizing a verse that you really love and not just reading it, but memorizing. Maybe then you want to memorize that entire passage of context around that verse, and then you want to do the whole chapter, and then you want to start actually memorizing out from there. And that is an incredible challenge. Now we did this in a way, we wanted to get God's word into our heart. And one of the best ways to do that is by writing God's word down. That's how I'm able to help memorize stuff all the time. And this is really important. Uh, so we did uh, a little while ago, we did a series through the book of Colossians and I gave out everyone a journal and you guys actually wrote out the book of Colossians. Now, I don't know if everyone did it. I'm sure some people gave up uh, during that, but going through the whole book of Colossians and just writing it out by hand is a great way to memorize scripture. And one of the tips that I want to give you for memorizing scripture and that she gives in the book is to memorize with someone else. Be held accountable, uh, choose passages that have special meaning, start small, challenge yourself more, and set realistic goals. And the last one is get creative. Those are all really great tips um, for understanding how to go about memorizing. It's really hard. And even in this book, she gives uh, some places that you can go, some different websites that have really great models for memorizing scripture. And I wanna encourage you, a lot of you might say, hey, I, I just, I've tried to memorize scripture before and I just can't. Well, I, I believe you can. And there's a couple reasons. I know that we have the capacity to memorize all kinds of things. We know song lyrics like the back of our head. Songs that we don't even know why, we just can remember it from when we were a kid. That happens to me all the time. I'm like, I don't even know how I still remember all these words. But they're, they're there, we've connected it because we made it a repetition. We've sang that song so many times, uh, we know what it sounds like. And look, if you wanna even start there, I recommend finding a hymn an old hymn full of truth, or our, our song that you love full of truth, memorize the lyrics like someone who would be leading that worship song. Know it like you're gonna lead it. And make sure that those truths are, uh, talk to yourself about it, sing it um, to yourself all day long. This is one of the ways, because so many amazing Christian songs 
old hymns, worship songs we sing are based on God's word. Now, this isn't a replacement for God's word, but something you can do. And I believe you can do that. And I want to challenge you not to waste this season. We have a season where things are kind of down. Things are kind of chill. Some of the things that you would normally be doing, you're not able to do. A lot of time to fill up. So what are you doing with that time? Text somebody. Challenge your small group leader or your parents to memorize a passage with you. Make it a priority in your life, not just to read God's word, but to store it up in your heart. The next thing, number three, is praying. Now, this is kind of goes hand in hand, reading God's word and praying. And this is what the book says. Fundamentally, my engagement with God's word leads organically to prayer. So there is a connection between God's word and prayer. They aren't two distinct things necessarily. They actually kind of connect in a lot of ways. I love uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 uh, and 18. And this you're probably familiar with this. It says, pray without ceasing. And then it goes on to say, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And, and maybe you're like, what is really, what does pray without ceasing mean? Because I can't, I have to go to class, I have to eat dinner, you know, I, I can't really actually pray without ceasing. So what does that actually mean? What is Paul telling us? Well, I love what Jaquel says. She says, this happens when our love for God and trust in God ties us to him throughout the day. So that everything we're doing is a reflection of God's love and trust in our lives. So when we are trusting God with every part of our life, we are really praying without ceasing because we are working and constantly connecting with him in all these different ways. And I want that to be a goal in our life. But really prayer when reading God's word is so key. So when we sit down to read God's word, we are actually prayerfully doing that. We're not just reading and being like, well, we're done reading. We're actually taking time to pray through that and saying, God, what do you want to speak to me today through your word? And we would read it and we can thank God for all that he is doing in our life as we read. And remember that prayer is a privilege. This is something that um, that Jesus opens up for us, that we no longer have to uh, pray. Uh, we don't have to pray to a saint or we don't have to have someone pray on our behalf um, or anything like that, we can pray directly to the God of the universe. And this is what Jesus made possible through, uh, through his death and resurrection. And I am so thankful that we can have that a personal community with God. And prayer enables us to do that. So don't miss, don't miss all that prayer opens up for us. And the last thing that Jaquel talks about is evangelism. Now, this isn't probably what you're thinking about. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read the Bible. I spend time in prayer. I even memorize a little bit. And that now you're talking to me about evangelism. Now, this is kind of an, an old school word, but it really just means verbally sharing the gospel. And it's that simple. And I love what it says, communicating the gospel. Anyone who faithfully relates the essential elements of God's salvation through Jesus Christ is evangelizing. This is true whether your words are spoken, written, or recorded, and whether they are delivered to one person or to a crowd. And so when you are communicating the gospel, verbally communicating the gospel, you are evangelizing. And that's so important. Now here's the caution. Sometimes in our Christian faith, sometimes we get to the point where we're like, I'm just going to, I'm the, you know, I believe that I'm the light. And so I'm just going to live my life. And hopefully people just by watching me live my life for Jesus will eventually come to know Christ. Now, I believe that to an extent, I believe that our life is a light and is a display of Jesus, but also it is massively important that we would open our mouths and begin to share. And here's the thing. If everything you do, if everything you do, you consider evangelism, then really nothing is evangelism. If everything is evangelism, then nothing is evangelism. Evangelism is specific. It is opening our mouths and verbally sharing our faith with other people. Uh, I love Mark chapter 16, verse 15. This is kind of the, the great commission in the book of Mark. And it says this, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole world. All believers are called to go and proclaim. We are, the Bible calls us ambassadors for the sake of Christ. And so Romans, Paul makes it clear in Romans that there needs to be a verbal proclamation for people to hear and believe. This is so important. Now, we think about evangelism like somebody 
preaching to a big crowd, like a big rally or someone on the street corner preaching the truth of God. But evangelism is also a very relational type thing. This is one of the best ways to do evangelism. And it is really about discipleship. And a lot of what Jesus did, Jesus did teach the crowds, but some of the most important things, it was with his friends in a small circle of people, with those conversations he had one-on-one -on -one with his friends and disciples. That is where Jesus was doing some of the, his best evangelism. And the thing is, you know people, your parents, leaders, and myself, your pastor, might might never get a chance to talk to you about Jesus. You have that opportunity with them. You play on the sports team with them. You're in class with them. Students and, and friends that I may never get a chance to meet. And look, bringing them to church is a great way to get them into a Christian community and to expose them to the truths of the gospel. But one of the best ways for your friends who don't know Jesus to know Jesus and have their life go from death to life is for you to share the truth of Jesus, the truth of the gospel with them. And that requires opening your mouth and sharing. Um, you say, well, I don't, I don't know about getting up and, and preaching. I'm not asking you to get up and preach. But everyone in here is capable of having a conversation about the work that Jesus is doing in your life. How is Jesus changing your life right now? And how can you simply share that with other people around you, especially your friends that don't know Jesus? And remember, in all of this, we are partners with God in his great work. It is his desire to see people come to know Christ, and he has invited us to get to partner alongside of him. I, I love what she says at the end of this chapter. We are talking about the all-powerful and infinitely good Savior of the world. He is our Savior. He desires people to be saved, and we get to partner with him. He is good and desires people to come to know him. Like that encouraging teacher, he is cheering us on in the great work that he has set out before us. So don't miss out on these opportunities right now. There are so many great things that we can be doing, having a rhythm and discipline for reading God's word and even memorizing scripture is so key. Spending time in prayer and making sure that prayer is an important part of our life is so key. And even spending time opening our mouths and sharing the truth of the gospel is so important. I don't want you guys to miss that. I also want to encourage you with one last thing. Try to make this, when you think about your rhythms, I encourage you to try to make it part of your morning routine. And I, I want to remind you that um, you don't have to get it, start doing it right when you get out of bed, but to make it a part of your morning before you get into the rest of your day, to start your day with your first energy, the same way we give of our first fruits. Give God of the first fruits of your time and your energy, spending time in God's word. It doesn't have to be an incredibly long time, but set aside time in your morning, change around your morning routine, whatever you need to do to make sure you get time in God's word, memorizing scripture, praying to start your day off. You can continue that throughout the day. You can also read in the evening, but set a time at the beginning of the day to do this. It will change your world. I promise you it will be so encouraging for you. Um, I want to end this time uh, as we kind of conclude. And there are some questions uh, in the back of this chapter that I thought were really important this week, so I didn't want to miss. And so actually, I just want to ask these questions to you as you're watching before we jump on to the next thing. And I want to give you just a second to reflect over these questions. So here are the questions. If you haven't looked in the book or if you have your book with you, you can go ahead and check them out right now. So the first question is, out of these four, what disciplines do you find the most difficult to cultivate? Why do you think that is? So out of those four, reading God's word, praying, uh, memorizing scripture, evangelizing, what disciplines do you find the most difficult to cultivate or to, to build a routine or, or do consistently? Which ones are hardest for you? And why do you think that is? So think about that. What's been hard? Do you, do you find it difficult to have a consistent time of reading God's word? Maybe you don't understand it. You can get frustrated. Have you had a hard time memorizing? Maybe you've just never been taught to do that or just never even tried that. And you just think you'll be bad at it. Have you had a hard time praying where you get distracted and you, and you don't know even what to say to God at sometimes? Or maybe you're afraid um, to open up your mouth and, and share the gospel. Maybe you're wondering what people will think about you if you start to talk like that. But I want to encourage you that these are all important, valuable parts of our Christian faith. I don't want you to miss out on all that God has for you as you continue to grow in the joy of Jesus in these areas. 
Number two, I love this. Think about some of the godliest people you know either personally or throughout history. What priority did they make cultivating spiritual disciplines? What steps can you take today to follow their example? Look, I, I don't know who you know specifically, but man, I hope that you have somebody that you look up to spiritually in your life. Um, hopefully it's other than me. I, I, I love to, to be a guidance in that area, but hopefully you have friends, um, mentors, maybe a family friend, or even your parents that you look up to in a spiritual way. And you can even have a conversation with them and say, hey, what? how, how did you create some of these rhythms and how has that helped you? Or maybe there's a, 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 a writer, an author, a theologian, or, or someone that you can look to or, or, or look up um, how they went about their day and their spiritual disciplines to know, um, to motivate you in your life. I think that would be really important. And the last one is, think about this, why is it so important to remember the heart of spiritual disciplines? And what is the heart of spiritual disciplines? That we are not working for acceptance, but we are working from acceptance. That we've already been saved by faith, not by our works, so that no one can boast, but that also we are created um, to do good works. We are created as his workmanship. So don't miss out. Have a passion and desire to do good works, but make sure that it is from first knowing the hope that uh, you have in Jesus. I love you guys so much. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you real soon.